Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyiyati a'malina ma yahdihi allahu fala mudilla lah wa ma yudlil fala hadiya lah وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله family and what do you know about family and what brings a family and how important the family is well I hope by now you know what the pillars of Iman are and you know what the pillars of Islam are and you can relate to halal and haram and why and you can submit to the command Zakallahu khairan if you know this command is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is the right not the left so they don't have to come and shake you drinking with your left. It's reverse camera, brother, you know. One man team. <clears throat> if we tell you something is haram, the whole purpose of starting with Tawheed and starting with the pillars of Iman, pillars of Islam, not only because it is the basis and the foundation, but also so you know when we say something haram that's it you give up you don't argue you don't uh, try to rationalize it if uh, the evidence is clear that's it even if you don't or it doesn't make sense to you you still submit to it and you ask why but you don't ask why before you submit if I tell you shaking hand with the opposite gender is haram because Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that for some of you to be stabbed with a needle in his head, big needle, it's better for him than to touch the hand of a woman who is not halal for him to touch. That's it. You submit to that and then if you want to ask, why you can ask but you don't ask why and then you submit that means you're not a muslim when you say i'm a muslim that means you submit first then you find out so we talked about the pillars all of them alhamdulillah and we should be making sense here when we talk about something go to the reference of what we talked about or maybe we we'll remind you about it before I talk about the family, we have to understand some foundations. And those foundations are called the five necessities in Islam. Five necessities in Islam. There are five necessities. You have to have it. And We'll talk about it, inshallah, and then we'll see where the family fits and how to do that. These are the ultimate benefits which a man or any man must enjoy in order to lead an honorable life, the five necessities. All divine laws have commanded their preservation and prohibited anything that contradicts them. Where did these five necessities come from? The scholars followed all the commands in the religion. Every command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet And they concluded that it all pours into these five. Meaning every command, if you look at it, it will serve 
one or more of these five necessities. And that's why they have to be there and they have to be protected and at the same time you have to establish it. And we will see. Islam urges its adherents to protect such necessities so that they may serve them well in the worldly life and in the hereafter. Muslims in all parts of the world form one single community. As we all know, the Prophet ﷺ told us that believers are like a sound building. Each one has a place to support the other, just like pillars. One pillar supports the other pillar and you have a sound building. So when we talk about those five, we need to recognize two things. Recognize those five necessities and appreciate them. And the second one is protect them against any violations. Number one of those five necessities, religion. You're here for the religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for the religion. This is the main reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ That we have sent in every nation a messenger to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from false gods. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every nation, He sends a messenger to tell them, worship me and only me and stay away from any idols or any other worships or any other gods different than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the command, establishing the religion and to preserve it from any harm. He prohibited, for instance, worshiping false gods, engaging in superstitions and committing forbidding acts. Forbidding acts, superstition and no gods. All of these are prohibited. Why? So you can only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and establish that religion that you are created for. So this is number one, religion. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that briefly. So you get the point and then we get in our topics. Second one is life. So we have religion and now life. Life of who? Your life, my life, our life. When you, when you talk about life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to preserve human life because without your life there would be no religion who's going to worship it's you so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the religion created you for serving and worshiping and you have to preserve your life that's why it is haram to kill not others but also yourself you cannot kill yourself because your life is not yours Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to you and commanded you to protect it. So that's why if you understand this, you understand why suicide is haram. Because the life is not yours. If I kill you or I kill myself, no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the same. He gave me the life and he gave you the life. So both lives belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just like I don't have right to kill you, I don't have right to kill myself. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill yourself. And made anyone who kills another person go to hell. And the ayah says permanently, but that means long, 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 long time for killing someone. So the same thing applies to you. So life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ You have prohibitions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, If you are in necessity and you're about to die, then you can break the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve your life. Because this life has to stay to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if there is something haram to do, in order you to save yourself, you do that, provided that it's not an aggression against somebody else's life, because you have no right to preserve your life at the expense of somebody else's life. 
يعني me and him drowning if I hold his foot I save myself but he will drown I have no right to do that I would be considered a criminal I killed him but generally there is no food but haram food and if I don't eat I die then you can eat same thing with drink same thing with medicine you can break the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve your life so Prophet Muhammad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said وَلَا تُلْكُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَ don't throw yourself in something that is going to lead to make you lose your life why? because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to preserve that life and that's why there is the rule of retribution or qisas if you kill someone you get killed what's the purpose of this rule so no one would do it so everybody is alive and everybody worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people live in peace so I take your life then my life has to be taken in exchange for your life so no one will do that and no one would yani, uh, attack the life of other people and this is all to preserve the life the third one is the mind your brain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam prohibits anything that is bound to have a negative effect on the mind which may impair your judgment so the intellect is one of the greatest blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with and that's what really distinguish you from animals Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." you have been honored and the biggest honor that you have over the animals is the intellect through which you believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you make judgment and you improve and you serve and you are obligated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship on such so it is the faculty that uh, you have to really take care of it for that reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu innama al khamru wal maysiru wal ansabu wal azlamu ridsum min amal al shaytan fajtanibu intoxicants gambling stone altars and divining errors are abominations devised by whom by the shaytan so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said avoid it if you are truly a person who wants to be successful so the main one here we focus on is alcohol why intoxicants are haram because they mess up with your mind and if you don't have the mind you have no judgment you don't know how to worship you will not be worshiping right you might end up killing someone else you know it's amazing that a friend of mine was giving a lecture a few days ago and while he was giving the lecture he was talking about halal food and halal drinks and haram food and drinks and he was mainly focusing on alcohol why is it haram and he was mentioning some of these ayat while he was doing that he received a text message from his wife saying that her father has committed suicide why because he was under the influence of alcohol subhanallah while he was given the lecture he received the text message referring to the same thing and I know you probably usually most of us when we say something is haram because it leads to this you say oh you know how many people did that in Islam one case is too many one case is too many if one person kills himself or this act leads to the life of one person that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the sanctity of the human being or uh, of the, the believer is more dignified than the Kaaba than the whole universe because it's big in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he set all of these rules to protect the life so when you take your mind 
you're going to take your life or somebody else's life you're going to not fulfill the purpose of your creation <clears throat> you're going to commit all kinds of haram because you don't know what you're doing and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning before alcohol was prohibited it came gradually because people were so much addicted to alcohol at the pagan time that the Prophet وسلم, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to do it gradual before one time so people are far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, far away from anything and uh, he used it gradually. So one of the ayat that says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqrabu salah wa antum sukara or you who believe don't come to salah while you are under the influence of alcohol. Why? حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا مَا تَقُولُونَ So you know what you're saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to say Allahu Akbar, Salaamu Alaikum, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, At-Tahiyyatu Lillah, and you have no idea what you're saying. So you can make analogy here, that if you pray and you don't understand what you're saying, no difference. Drunk or you don't understand, the same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited this, so you know, and definitely, you have to educate yourself so you know, otherwise uh, and you, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot imagine someone praying and reading and not knowing what he or she does and live all of their life not worrying about understanding. And if you take all the salah, a page or two, translation, you understand the meaning in minutes. And many people don't care about it. If you come and ask a person, what is the meaning of At-Tahiyyat? <coughs> and if they say like, greetings, okay. Why are you greeting? You're greeting who? And then you go on. It's, it's, it's so hard to think that someone can do this over and over and not understanding all of that. And that's why uh, all of these things, yani, inshallah, we want to briefly talk about it so we can reflect something. So, the mind is so important for that reason. The property, number four is the property. So we have religion, and we have life, and we have mind, and we have the property. Which is really wealth, your money. How can you live without money? Who pays rent, who buys food? You have to have the money to live. Religion, you, mind that serves and worships and invents and makes sense of the commands, and money, so you can stay alive. Money, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Islam urges the followers to protect their property and preserve their wealth and commands them to earn a living making all commercial transactions lawful in order to protect the wealth. So you cannot uh, get involved in transaction that is haram. You cannot deal with usury or riba because it's prohibited. Why? Because it takes advantage. This is just one of the many reasons it takes in Islam. I, Islam wants me to help my brother and my sister not to take advantage of them. When he is in need to borrow money from me, that means he doesn't have money. So when I give him money and I tell him, give me more money back, I'm really taking advantage of him rather than helping him. You don't do that. That's why we give it in charity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you take it in interest, so you can increase your money, it will not increase with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you give it in charity, it will be increased multiple times. I take a dollar through interest. Yeah, it looks like the $10 became 11 or the 100 became 101. But if I give a charity a dollar, it drops it to 99. This is how it appears to us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the long run, He takes care of your health, which costs you a lot of money to do. He protects you from accidents, He protects you from diseases, He protects your family, 
He will get you more money. He will get you a better job. He blesses your trade. There's so many million things that you can get blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply because you're doing that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect that property, He prohibited all of those things. And that's why He said, Ya ayyuha ladina abanu, ittaqu Allah wa daru ma baqiya min riba in kuntum mu'mineen. Tayyip. So how many we have? Four. Religion, life, mind, wealth or property, and the fifth one is our topic. What do you think it is? Progeny or offsprings or honor, whatever you call it, it all falls in the same category which is family. This is the fifth one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to establish that and wants you to take care of that. And the best way, it's not the best way, the way to do that is through marriage. Keep in mind, every desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in you as a human being, He subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He prohibits that desire on you, He always gives you a way out with a halal thing to do. Just the attraction that you have between a male and a female, this is natural. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that. And He prohibited zina. He prohibited illegal or illicit relationships. So he gave you an alternative, a way out, which is marriage. Marriage is the only legal way that you can have a family. I want you to think on that. Look at the people, for instance, who have relationships without marriage. How much relationship do they have with the family of one another? the brothers and the fathers and the mothers and how long that relationship continues. Yeah, a person dating another person, it's like life goes on. Nobody knows what and who goes where and what is done and what is not done. Jungle. But when you have marriage, there is a place, there is a house, there is a contract, there is legal documents, there are rights and there are obligations. Uh, there's so many things if you want to say. It is a system by itself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created to make a family. That's the only way you can have a family. In fact, that's the only way you can have love between a husband and a wife, brother. I don't think you are <laughs> drinking your left water through the camera. <clears throat> rule number one, or oh, this is the main rule, every relationship between man and woman, the rule is, or the essence of it, haram. Every relationship between opposite genders is haram. Exception, husband, wife, and close family from those that cannot marry. Like sisters, mothers, aunts, uncles, and brothers. These are halal. Every other relationship is haram. You cannot say about an opposite gender he or she is my friend. This is not to say you cannot talk, but you cannot have them as a friend. Like he's my friend, I come and I sit with him and I chit chat with him and we joke and all of that. That is, alhamdulillah, normal. Boy and a girl, haram. Sami Awala? Smiling is the first time you heard it, right? Now, I never heard that. Exactly. 
Maho ya Sheikh. You can't talk to the opposite. Like, <coughs> so since you can't do all that, then how are you going to meet the. This is uh, you're jumping to conclusions, brother. We are in the beginning right now. <coughs> we'll get to that, inshallah. Oh, Sheikh, what about cousins? Cousins, uh, okay. no, like sure, sure, yeah. no, 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 brother. Any question to me is a valid question. Just because he laughed doesn't mean I don't belittle any question. Cousins, the question is, can you marry them? Yes. Then it's prohibited. Keep in mind. Keep in mind. I mean, pay attention to what I'm saying. Friend relationship. It's not just you talk, you want something, you want to do something, assalamu alaikum, you greet and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about relationship where you sit and you talk and you joke and you play and all of that. This is haram. I am not the one who's saying that. And we'll get to that, inshallah, and we'll prove it to you. Inshallah. Tayyip. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show you how great He is. He created your wife from you. Which means you get along. Which means you feel connection, which means you will protect because your wife is part of you. I don't think you would do anything to harm your hand or to harm your eye or your brain or whatever. The same thing with your wife. So this is a huge sign, not only for this purpose, but also to get along. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا so you will find peace, love, and serenity, and compassion through one another. So the wife is the source of peace in the house. Who agrees? Meaning, meaning, if the house, if the wife is chaos, the house is chaos. If your mom or the wife is doing good, educated, taking care of her position, the whole house is in peace. Generally, generally, of course, there are exceptions. There can be someone there who would come and ruin everything, like husband, but Generally, you have, if, the, if you go home and your mom is in good mood, the whole house is in good mood. This is just, it just you don't need uh, proof to that. If you go to the house, think of it this way. When your mom is angry, <laughs> even if your dad doesn't know why she's angry, automatically he gets angry. It's, it's, it's like a, a button that you push, you find it this way. And if the mom is happy, alhamdulillah. What if the dad is mad? Dad is mad and... <laughs> your dad is not there. The dad is hardly there. The dad is working outside. So if he is mad, naturally, just like I said, it will affect, but I'm talking generally the wife or the mother is the source of happiness to the husband. If the wife is not doing that, the husband can never be in peace. So the, the wife and the husband, you know, both, but mainly can absorb the husband. Yani hella, when you want something from your mother, or from your father, which is a successful way to get it? Through your mother. <coughs> Through your mother, you, you, will, you will get it accomplished. 
If you go face to face with your dad, you know how it is. Even if he refuses it, like if the, your mother says, you know, give him a hundred dollars. Even if he refuses it, in the back of his mind, he's going to end up giving it. Because all it takes is a couple of times that the wife just touches his heart. You know, he's been doing so good. You haven't given him that last year. You done. She brings uh, the time of uh, years back how you did. Then he ends up giving it. So your mom can make things work for you. Your the mom is the one who gathers the family. I think the father, if he wants to gather the family for a meeting, it would take a lot of time and effort to do that. If the wife calls the kids and everyone, okay, Sunday you come over to the house, everybody comes. If the father does that, uh, you know, dad, I have a football game, uh, you know, dad, I have this and I have that, but to the mother, more than likely you would cancel everything and go. So the mother gathers. Yani as the scholars say, el um tajma. She she makes a difference. That's the importance. And that's why Islam puts so much emphasis on the mother educating her because she is the one who's going to more than likely take care of the children. The husband is out busy bring in the money and the mother is the one who is taking care of her uh, of the children educating them and taking care of them so if you come and uh, you look at your life how much really your dad participated in raising you very minimum he will give the money and send you to school and do all of that but mostly the mother sits with the children and teach them and uh, show them and guide them and all of that because she is there most of the time and the husband is not there and of course you know uh, you will find as I mentioned exceptions where husbands do a lot and some women don't do much so but we're talking generally type so it is uh, Rasul, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَذُرِّيًّا Messengers have wives and they have family so it's not just us and the messengers are going to live a different life. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ma'shar al-shabab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'a, al-ba'a fal yatazawaj. Al-ba'a yani the expenses of marriage. Anyone who is able have the expenses of marriage, then he should seek marriage. This is uh, an encouragement from the Prophet wasallam addressing the youth, mainly men, because they are the one who go ask the hand of the girl, not the other way around. And they are the one who support, and they are the one who protect and take care of us. So it's all in your, the ball in your court. You are the one if you have it. So it's not just, uh, you know, I want to get married. And do you have a job? No. Well, who's going to take care of the family and who's going to pay? It's you. So if you have the money, you should get married, married as early as possible. This is a command from the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, some people, even though they're mature, but they're not mature. And not, not everyone can have a family. Samaya yeah, Sheikh? Not everyone. Yani Halla, you find a person maybe 19 or 20 years old <coughs> behaving like a child. So I don't think this child can raise a child. And you have some people 14, 15 years old can actually have a family and they, they look yani, mature. It depends how you raised. Depends how you were raised, how your father dealing with you. Do you go with your dad? Do you, do you sit with men? Do you go to work? Do you, uh, that makes you mature. But if you are living on cookies and ketchup and, uh, <laughs> and all of this and the cereal and all of that until you're 20, I mean, I don't think 
this one is going to raise a family. So it's not, it's not easy. And he, when you think before our forefathers, and he, uh, I, I remember 15 or 16 years old, uh, they're married and they have children. And they have wonderful family and they raise them good. Because from six years, five years, six years, they are there uh, plowing and digging and picking and planting and everything. By 15, they have experienced five, 10 years experience of life. If we come and look at men nowadays, you probably enter college and you have no experience of cutting the lawn. You don't even cut it. You have a machine that cuts, you just push it. And you give a person that machine to push it, he doesn't know how to go around a tree. It's like, how do you do that? Hmm. Let's see. You know, you finish that and you find the right now. Yani, uh, how, do you, how do you gain that knowledge? Uh, through watching other people and working with other people. But if I give you anything and you haven't seen it before, you haven't used it, you're not going to do it. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, prohibited uh, or, or, or dis dispraised people who don't get married or those people, yani some of the uh, uh, companions came to ask about the worship of the Prophet wasallam. How does, he asked, they asked uh, his wives, how does he worship? So they told him, oh, he fasts and he eats. And uh, he doesn't fast much. He doesn't uh, really pray Qiyam too much or extra prayer. And uh, he marries. So they said, oh, that's the Prophet. That means, you know, he's so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't need to do much. But for us, one of them said, I'm going to fast forever. And the other one said, I'm going to do Qiyam all night. And the other one, he said, I'm not going to get married. Now you probably wonder why he said he's not going to get married. They're doing the opposite of what he's doing? No, because marriage is responsibility. Oh, he can't and if he family. wants to take care of himself and take care of another person and a family, so he doesn't have much time to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his understanding. So the Prophet sallam heard about it. He called them. He said, you said such and such, you said such, and he said, yes. He said, well, as for me, I fast and I eat, and I pray and I sleep, and I marry women. If you're not going to follow the path that I'm following, you're not one of us. Well, the, the whole idea, people don't understand that taking care of your family and taking care of your wife is the best worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you for. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you give a dinar, dollar, in charity for a needy person, or you give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or you give it to your wife, the most rewarding one is the one you give to your wife. So, hasanat, in fact, marriage gives you 50% of your religion. <clears throat> ya Rasul Sallallahu said, فَقَدْ اسْتَكْمَلَ نِصْفَ دِينِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that most people go to hellfire because of their tongue and what they say and because that this is a desire and the second desire is marriage or intimate relationship. So if you think of it, that's two. If you take care of one, that's 50%. When you get married, you took care of one. So you're 50%. Your, ma your, your marriage gets you 50% closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you look at the life of non-Muslims, what does it really revolve around? Yani, what is their goal? Go after women, right or wrong? Yes or no? They work all week, 
and go party the weekend. Spend every penny they have, go back to work Monday, collect the money, get the check, and go party again, and go and spend it. What else? So, you get married legally, Islamically, have a family, you're going to be so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're going to preserve your money, and you're going to uh, get hasanat, and you're going to be part of this society, you build a society. Can you build a society through boyfriend-girlfriend relationship? You can never build a society. Even those who believe in it know that you cannot establish a strong society based on that. You cannot have a family institution based on that. And if you have it, it's so weak because it's like anything that happens, boom. Out, out, nothing, no rights, anything. And that's why you find uh, people twisting the rules and giving you a rule like, oh, if you live with someone for six months, consider it husband and wife. If you live with someone six months, why don't you marry them? Ask yourself why. Because they don't want the responsibility. So the relationship from the beginning is based on, I'm not going to take care of you. I don't want to be obliged to take care of you. I do what I like, and when I don't like, goodbye. I don't know you. But when you have legal marriage, there is a law that forces you to take care of. Through no marriage, children are gone. With marriage, they're taken care of. So this is, this is the beauty of making things legal. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina," And that's where we're uh, going to get closer to understanding relationship and no relationship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Do not get near committing fornication. Do not get near. He didn't say, do not commit adultery or fornication. He said, don't get near it. How do you get near it? Step, step, step. step, step. What are the steps? Hi, how are you? Handshake. What started the handshake? Why did you want to shake somebody's hand? Or introduce yourself to someone? Because you stare too much. You look too much. And what is looking? The Prophet ﷺ said, Anadra sahim min siham iblis. It's an arrow of the shaitan. If I shoot you with an arrow, chances I kill you. I may not kill you, but you'll be very injured. And sometimes you miss. So sometimes people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them. So you look and you touch. Or you touch and then you look. Which one is it, brother? Erfa Sotak. You finished taking selfies? Okay. Answer me, answer me. You look first or you touch first? Neither. Brother, I'm more talking general. I'm not talking you personally. You know, sometimes you come to set an example for a student or something. It's like, oh, I don't do that. I'm not saying you. You look once and you never do it again. You never again. So you said you look and then you touch, right? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. I asked the wrong person. Okay. Shaq, 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 Shaq. Shaq. Uh, sometimes you want to spice it up by asking some question. It turned out you asked the wrong person. You end up, you end up with... Uh, 
wrong goal or wrong thing that the opposite of what you are hoping for. And it, it doesn't take, uh, well, a half an hour to think about it. It's like, oh, you close your eyes and you just go, hi, sister. Assalamu alaikum. It's like, wow, well, let me think. You look first or you touch first? So you look and then it leads to the touch. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't get close to that. You walk to the area or to the place where the opposite gender is. And then you look and then you touch. All of these are steps to get you closer to zina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Now let me ask you this. In your opinion, which is really more yani, worse? Looking or touching? Touching. No. Which one? Touching. Huh? Touch. 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 Type. Why some people believe in no staring and no lust looks, and at the same time they go, Salam alaikum, and they shake hands? Type. How about if you don't shake hands, if you just touch the shoulder? What's in the shoulder? Bone, right? What's in the hand? A lot of senses. Ask Chinese people, they will tell you. Everything is in your hand. So, you allow this and you don't allow that. And you allow this, uh, you allow this and you don't allow them. I mean, it doesn't make sense. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited simply looking, it makes huge sense that touching is more haram and more prohibited. And if this is, the ayah says, don't get close to committing zina, then how can you have, then what do you think of a friendship? Is it getting close or getting far away? You're getting way too close. But he's just like my brother. Yeah, he's just like your brother, but you're not just his sister. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, the idea is uh, people always limit their mind. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, a stranger, if you feel that he is like your brother, then it's halal. And how can you have a consistency with what you feel about the person? Even when you talk age, she's like my dad and she's like my mom. Okay, you decided that. Or this person is old and this person is uh, not old. What is old to you? This person may say 40, the other person may say 30, the other person may say 50, 60, 70. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he prohibits something, he never gave you age. He never said if this is, yani, what, what amazes me, is one time I was listening to a talk show. Uh, I don't know if I told you this or not, but uh, the advisor, there was a call from a sister. She asked a question, uh, the therapist. She told her, I have a daughter. She is 11 or 12 years old. And she appears mature, but she's only, I think, within the range of 10 years or so, non-Muslims. And my husband tells me to not let her wear 
shorts and bikinis and all of that and go out. And she is fighting and arguing that she's only 10 years old. Do you know what the answer of the therapist is? She said, listen to your husband. He knows more than you do. This is, this is, it, it puts things in your mind that some people may think of you some way and you think another way. You're not a woman. So you know what attracts and what doesn't attract, and the woman doesn't. Let it be personal. If you come and you ask me a question, which one, the cutest one of you brothers? I would think all of you ugly. <laughs> personal. <laughs> Very ugly. Yeah, there's ugly and very ugly. <laughs> to come and say, oh, he is uh, beautiful or handsome, I, I, I don't really comprehend it. Now, I'm not that So the perspective of the person has to be from the other side, a lot more from that side, generally. So this is the advice of that woman. Listen to your husband. He knows if she, يعني, if she dresses like that, appropriate or not appropriate from a man point of view. And you follow. Same thing with Islam. So you don't get near zina. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how old, how young. Age is different to every person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put an age. When he said don't look or don't shake hand or don't touch, he didn't put an age. So even though the person may be very old, you may be forgiven for certain things. But at the same time, the best thing is to stay away. Yani why would I need to shake the hand of an older lady? What's the point? Salaam alaikum, salaam alaikum, how are you, how are you? That's the safest way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the understanding of this ayah. All the haram Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't commit this, don't commit this, don't commit this. But when it comes to zina, don't get near it. La taqrab. Don't get near it. And that is, it prohibits the walking, it prohibits the talking, it prohibits the halal, the, I mean the touching and the looking and all of that. طيب الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم when he went to Isra al Mi'raj he saw certain things and one of them he صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, saw like sort of like a well of fire small mouth huge there and in it being punished people who commit fornication and adultery. This is the day of judgment. Some of the punishment that the Prophet وسلم, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show him. Committing adultery, the Prophet وسلم, told us that لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن. Your faith leaves your heart and kind of hovers over you when a person commits zina. It's like, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't change, if you don't repent, if you don't, then faith is gone and you lose it. This is how evil it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَ وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا In fact, can you imagine the free women at the time of the pagans never really they were they were surprised that a free woman would do that they were saying it's like this is for prostitutes this is for slaves 
Would a free woman do that? Commit adultery? Or zina? They were asking the Prophet ﷺ, Would a believing, would a woman like that do that? They're not, they're not. Now that's even before Islam. In fact, hijab was there before. Before they accepted, before Islam came, women who are free women, they used to cover and to dress like that. If you go and there are some videos from old times in the 19th, uh, 19th century, you see women dressed. And this is, this is basic for dignity, for honor, for preservation, for haya, you name it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that punishment and the punishment for a person who commits zina, where? Public. Why public? So people see what happens. It's not like, oh, behind bars, you know, put him in jail and nobody knows. You find other people doing it. But when you see someone is punished publicly, other people go, whoa, watch out. You're going to get that. The same thing if you kill someone, you get killed. Imagine if that person is done publicly where everybody can see. That is deterrent for other people from committing all of that. If the person is not married, a hundred slashes. If the person is married, stoned to death. Because it's, it's, it's so hard to imagine that someone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sufficed him with the halal, and then he goes for the haram. This person has exceeded the, the, the dignity. He has exceeded the normal uh, fitra of, of the person. Uh, this is like a, a person, he has all kinds of halal food, and then he goes and uh, eats pork or eats something else, and he's got all kinds of meat, but he wants to go and get the haram. Subhanallah, this is, this is something special in our, in our religion. This is what we call whims and desires. Desires and whims, a lot of people explain it the same. Desire is things that you desire. You desire to eat, you're hungry, so you may steal to eat. But you have a whim. What's a whim? A whim is a desire to enjoy something prohibited. Yani, you have the money, but you go steal because it feels better to just go rob. Or it feels better to, you're married to just go with another person. So this is whims, and that's why we always put the two words together, and some people uh, cannot really distinguish between the two. They think of it as desire. No, this whim is to desire something prohibited and haram already, and that's a step way higher than committing the haram. You start to enjoy the haram. Can you imagine? And when you talk about relationships, you're talking about enjoyment. Marriage is happiness, is fun. Those people who look all the time and touch all the time and walk all the time and talk all the time with the intimate relationship between husband and wife, it will never be perfect. Because there is a desire for the eye, and there is a desire for the ear, and there is a desire for the mouth, and there is a desire for the hand, and there, is, there are so many desires that you have. A person who lives according to the teachings of the religion enjoys all of these desires in their family relationships. A person who doesn't he will enjoy a fraction of it. Anything that you see too much, it's no longer fun. You want to see different and more. And that's why you find uh, righteous people 
have more happy relationships or more happy life than others because they protect their eyes, they only look at their spouse, and they only listen to their spouse, and they only touch their spouse. So those desires and those feelings are preserved and they enjoy it. Other people who don't, you already lost it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give you. So it would be just more of a relationship uh, like animals with yani, all respect because uh, you're not living by any rules. Uh, there's no halal and haram to you. So all of that, you, you look, why do you look? Why do you look? If it's not fun, is it fun to look? Yes or no? It's not? Of course it is, brother. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you to not look? How is it fun? <laughs> Close your eyes, you would understand. <laughs> Hala, let me ask you something. How much fun you would have if I serve you a dish and you close your eyes and you eat it? Tayyip. I serve you the same dish that you ate with your eyes closed and you said, mm, it tastes good. And, that was a... and after that, I said, open your eyes and you see the plate and you go, did I eat that? What makes you say that? Your eyes. Why sometimes when you go, it's not sometimes, when you go to a restaurant, the same thing that you make at home, you can fry an egg and everything, and you eat it from the restaurant, maybe you like it more. Why? Because they just put it in a nice plate and put a touch of parsley in the middle and a small potato here, and it looks, mm, looks good. So your eye has a desire. Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah, he said, وَفِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِيهِ الْأَعْيُنْ In Jannah, everything that your eyes desire. Your eyes, number one in desires. And that's why the look is prohibited. Because once you look, that can start the desire and then what comes after that is the mind is thinking to talk and to touch and to walk and to introduce and to lie and to do all of other things because of your look. And that's why you're allowed one look. And the second one the Prophet ﷺ said, against you, I know you, you, you go like that and I know what your plan is. It's a devilish plan, bro. Yeah, you just pass and you see something, you go, wow. He said, oh, you know, alhamdulillah, I have one look. Uh, okay, now no, it, it, it doesn't work that way. This is provided that you are not planning on it. All of a sudden you look and you saw something you desire. You turn your head and you look down. So all of these things are part of what we are talking about. Now, inshallah. Look at this, I will conclude with uh, this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he, he prohibited for you to enter the house when there was only no one there but women. And one of the companions asked, he said, O Prophet of Allah, how about Ilhamu? Who's Ilham? The brother your brother-in-law for the sisters, the brother-in-law. Alhamu, he said, al maut The brother-in-law equivalent to death. What does that mean? It means more haram than the stranger. Because the stranger is a stranger. If a neighbor sees Who's that guy? He'll be asking and you're talking and everything. So committing the haram is far. But the relative is like, who's going to question? Oh, he's, he's just the relative. That's a brother-in-law. That's my brother. You just go there.
The Prophet وسلم, why he put too much emphasis on this? Because we belittle that. You find people living in the same room, brothers and their spouses, in the same room, in the same house, they eat together, they sit together, they joke together, they, uh, all of their life together. And you go, oh, you know, this is my sister-in-law, this is my brother, stop for Allah, brother, what you? And the, the, the Prophet Wasallam said, death is better than that. So just because you're accustomed to it, or this is the tradition, doesn't mean it is all okay by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to come and say, <clears throat> oh, this is my sister-in-law, this is my brother-in-law, this is like my father, and this is like my mother, and this is like my sister, that is down in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't wash, and it's not acceptable, and that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited all of that, so to avoid falling into the haram. Next time, inshallah, we will talk about how women are equal partners of men, and then we get into khutbah. You know what khutbah? What? Asking the hand of the girl, and then the engagement, and we'll see how this is done and what's the proper, appropriate way of doing it and the wrong way of doing it just like uh, the brother who was taking a selfie he was he asked a question next time inshallah brother that question will be valid inshallah well how else would you know well you'll find out inshallah next time when you get there we'll tell you how you get married how old are you uh, 17, 17. <laughs> Where's your milk bottle? <laughs> Any questions? Good one. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No question time. Next time there will be a lot of questions. Taib jazakum Allahu khairan subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Sorry guys, just really quick. We have a couple of announcements. Um we mentioned